Today's session is all about some of the things that people might have missed while they've been concentrating on Brexit and things like that. There have been some really surprising Supreme Court decisions which actually change the law of contract in the UK. This sort of clause that you get in contracts, there will be no variations to this contract unless that variation is in writing, has been signed. It was, right up until last year, a bluff. These clauses did not work. Why? Because the court always held that you can always vary a contract with a new contract. Up until the end of last year, where they said, effectively, now these clauses are effective and you can't change a contract. They said, well, clearly, if you wanted to change the clause that said you can't make a change to the contract except it is in writing, you should refer to it. And if you haven't done it expressly, then effectively, you're still bound by that clause. There are some quite significant changes that people will need to take account of. On liability, the court won't intervene in the way that it has done in the past. On things like implied uh, terms, the courts feel more flexibility to intervene and to find an implied term where they haven't before. That's a significant change to the law before. Well, there's been two cases just last year on this. The first one was Motor Track and FCA Australia. This was a contract for the provision of digital marketing services, so providing digital marketing services to market a business. And there was a limitation of liability clause that excluded loss of profits. What the company then said is, you failed to provide the service properly, we want to make a claim. And the court realised, well actually most of that claim is loss of profits. Can you therefore rely on an exclusion of loss of profits? And the court said, yes. Loss of profits is one of those things you often see in limitation of liability clauses and you often skirt over it. But where the service is absolutely intended to provide a certain amount of profit, if it's an advertising service, for instance, clearly that's not something you're going to want to accept as the customer. Similar vein is Good Life Foods and Hall Foods. This was a provider of a fire prevention system that didn't work. Factory burnt down in a fire. Limited liability to the purchase price of the fire prevention system, which was £7,000. They excluded virtually all liability. So they excluded much of their liability except for the cost of the actual thing itself, which is clearly very, very low. But the court said, yes, that's perfectly reasonable. And one of the things they relied on was that the fire suppression company had offered the option of insurance. It was always possible to get an additional cover at an additional fee. Implied terms, it always used to be the case that courts would have been really reluctant to imply terms into a contract in order to make the contract make sense unless it's absolutely necessary. And that's been followed by various cases, Bonsman and BCG, BCG a consultancy, an individual was employed with a view to becoming a partner, he was paid an amount of money with a view to him paying that amount back when that person became a partner uh, with BCG. Now that person sadly left BCG before they became a partner, which demanded the question, well actually, surely you have to pay the amount back then, but they hadn't put it in the contract. And the court said, well, no, you could have put it in there. You didn't put it in there. There's no requirement to pay back the loan. Similarly, just more recently, Al Jaber and Al Ibrahim, this was a loan agreement, straightforward loan agreement, loan of 30 million pounds. There was an intention to put an interest rate in there, but they forgot to put it in the document. Can you therefore imply a term that clearly interest was intended to be paid? Clearly, that's what the parties intended. The answer was no. No, you've not put it in the agreement, therefore it doesn't apply. Then suddenly, something else happened. Wells and Devani, this was an estate agent. An estate agent found a property for a buyer. The sale went through from the seller to the buyer and the estate agent hadn't put his commission in there. Now following all of the previous cases, you might think, well, you didn't put it in. However, the Supreme Court took a different approach. They decided clearly what you intended is for commission to be payable. Clearly that's what happens normally and therefore you can rely on an implied term. In terms of oral contracts, it doesn't matter where the contract is formed. The things that matter are what was said, how it was said and the process that was run through when that contract was entered into. Where there is a situation where a contract is made in a social situation, Mike Ashley and Blue, this was the case where Mike Ashley over quite a lot of drinks, he made uh, this remark and talked about his financial director and if the financial director managed to get the share price above a certain figure then he would pay over a million pounds to the financial director and of course the share price did go over that amount 
And the question was, was that contract binding? And there was an argument that it wasn't binding because it was made in a pub uh, over a few drinks. And the court said actually it could be contractually binding. The fact it was made socially didn't matter. The fact that he was somewhat inebriated didn't matter. That what mattered was that the obligation was one that was probably impossible. It was probably impossible for the financial director to influence the share price in such a way that it would go above a certain figure. So it was held to be not a binding oral contract for that reason. However, by contrast, Rosalina and New Balance Athletic Shoes, and this was actually quite unusual because the contract had expired, so the period of the contract had expired, but it continued, continued on. The reason is there wasn't a new contract was both parties in their discussions had talked about signing of the agreement and therefore it was held that signing of the agreement was a significant event. That was known to both parties that there would be a signing. And they talked about an amendment, not a variation. Amendment, the court said, was a different new contract, was a variation, would be a variation to the existing contract. And therefore, clearly, uh, it was intended that a new contract would not arise until signing happened. It does matter what formality is referred to, so whether you've talked about a level of formality, how plausible the story is, is it likely that this is really what's happened, because that will be taken into account with an oral contract, and thirdly, how possible the obligation is. So the thing that was asked of the person, is it actually something that a person could control? They need to keep on top of contract law. There are some significant changes, and the law is changing all the time. As lawyers, we don't always, we don't always see it. We don't always notice, because the law is, is relatively niche, and it's the sort of thing that comes up only every so often. There is quite a bit of work to do to sift between the different bits of information that come your way as an in-house lawyer. So the challenge is working out what's important and what you need to change in drafting as a result of those cases. Mm -hmm.